Uh, so the whole thing is, uh, if everything goes right, you're going abroad, which is awesome. And uh, I do a lot of traveling, but the other part of it is that we, um, in communications, can use uh, uh, most of the photos that we have. We are looking for abroad photos every week when TWIP is at its normal self. And uh, plus the abroad contest and all of this. So the idea is to just give everyone some semi-basic, but uh, some information that you need to hopefully make the photos that you're going to take when you're abroad um, just a little better. And it will work the same if you're using a uh, DSLR, a digital uh camera or whether you're using a cell phone. So we get a lot of photos that are cell phone submitted and it's fine. Um, especially with today's new cell phones, it's pretty amazing the quality of the photos that you can get. Um, but there's a few things to remember that makes when you're submitting photos um, maybe a little different than what you normally would take. So um, you know, we're just going to kind of go through some, I'm going to go through some basic stuff uh, of compo uh, composition, uh, rule of thirds types of things. So a lot of you that possibly are, are, are some of you that are art majors, um, some of this will be kind of redundant, but um, in the big part, you hopefully will walk away with something. And at the end, we'll see what kind of questions and, and see what we can get to um, as far as the answers. So um, we can get started with the first uh, the first slide. Do I have operation? There we go. Look at that. I don't even have to move my hand. This is like a puppet to do it. Um, so one of the things that you are recording the way I the way I look at any time I'm traveling is you're recording observations of things that are happening around you. And you're gonna hopefully go to places that you're gonna see things that you don't see every day. Um, you will have some of the things will be the same, but a lot of the things may be a little different. And whether that's tradition, whether that's culture, whether it's you know um, just the architecture, any of that type of stuff is not like you normally uh, probably see you know each day in Geneva. So one of our our goals is when you're doing that is I tell everybody shoot as many photos if you think about it as you can because you're going to wish you had uh, when you return from a trip. Um, I on the other hand might be a little crazier than most. I shoot a lot of photos um, but I'm glad I did and there's also things that you know I have not photographed that I wish I had and there's also things that you may see that you just can't photograph it the way that you're going to see it. And sometimes you just have to face the fact that that's kind of the way it is. Um, some things are just meant to be seen and not necessarily have to capture every little bit. But when you're abroad, it's, um, it's pretty amazing when you're just walking and, and looking at things uh, what you can see. The photo that is up here now is a student submitted photo and these were all um, in India and there's a this rope went across a, a sidewalk in, a, in an alleyway and it was a line of notes written to God from the people of the city and people would come and they would bring their little notes and they would hang all of these on um, this line and anyone could stop and read them and see, uh, you know, and there was a lot of them. But the depth of this photo kind of gives you an idea that it's something a little different than you may uh, normally um, run into. So, um, okay, so, um, so observing and the observations of what you are um, seeing around you uh, every day. And you know you're gonna you'll get better at this as you go uh, through the trip, and uh, yeah. So you just want to you know you just be aware. Um, one of the things I've learned about being a photographer is um, after 40 some odd years, you see things differently. Um, 
the joke in my family is that most people go through life looking through a 50 millimeter lens if you're familiar with cameras and I go through life looking through a 200 millimeter lens because some people look out and they see a fence post and a field and some cows in it and I look and I see the barbed wire wrapped around the fence post and then I see the overall scene and then you see but you're also taking notes of all these little uh, tiny things that you see that bring uh, the whole idea of uh, that image um, back with you. So, um, so we can go on to the next one. So this is uh, an idea. Uh, one of the things I can tell you right now for this week in photos is you'll never go wrong if you're anywhere near a camel. Um, we like shots like this and if you look at this I can tell you that you are probably not in New York or New Jersey. Um, you're keeping the background, having something that people um, recognize right away. The, the, the land itself, of course, camels are definitely it. And it's our students actually doing what they do. Um, I'm not going to lie to you, when I first came here, I really thought when students went abroad that um, there was no real studying involved that everyone pictures that they sent us looked like everyone was on a vacation uh, to do things. And what we need is those things, but also what are you actually doing and studying and learning and, and having our students in the photos? Because that can be one of the more difficult ones for us to find. I can get, you know, 30 photos of young people in pubs which is fine. I can get 10 photos of everyone holding the Eiffel Tower in their hands, you know, in their hand when they put their hand up and I can get 10 photos of people trying to push the leaning tower back straight again. Um, those things, which are all part of what you should be doing when you're abroad because that's, that's just part of the deal. You're there, it's what you're gonna do. We all do the same thing. But on the other hand, if you're in Rome or you're in Prague or this type of thing. What is your environment like every day that you're in these classes? And um, teachers are very, uh, professors are very open usually in these classes to let you, you know, do that type of thing. And especially if you're doing like hands-on stuff, um, it's huge. I stopped into a classroom in Prague when I was there and uh, very different uh, type of classroom. It was only a class of seven and they were in a, just a building in downtown Prague. And it was an old, old building. And the, the building was amazing inside. And just capturing students in that environment, you know, says that this is part of what we are we're doing. But we're looking for the reflection of the overall experience of, of what you have. And the overall experience can be anything from like this camel shot to, I'm gonna show you a bunch of examples at the end. Um, it's, it's just putting you in the setting that you normally wouldn't be in. Anything that's out of your comfort zone and, and that hopefully is part of the whole abroad experience, which if you have not gone abroad and this is your first time going abroad, you will come back a completely different person. It's the most amazing transformation of kids that I've seen when they go abroad and when they come back. It's an amazing experience and you need to be able to have the visuals for that. You may not get back there again. You may. You may fall in love with it and go back who knows how many times. So, um, so you're looking for that reflection of, of what was your overall experience um, throughout the whole thing. And we're going to talk about what makes this photo work um, a little bit better. Um, Actually, we're gonna talk about it next. So we'll go to the next slide. And what makes the biggest thing on this work is called the rule of thirds. Um, when you take a photograph, the, the horizon, if you're taking an overall scene of a landscape or this type of thing, try not to keep the horizon like dead center in the photograph unless you are doing some type of a reflection and you want the exact reflection um, on the top and the bottom part of it. So photographers use what's called the rule of thirds. Most of your cell phones and cameras actually have a grid that you can turn on 
that shows you the rule of thirds when you're looking through it. So what the rule of thirds says is dividing a rectangular photo like this into nine sections. Anywhere that those lines cross are probably one of the places that you want to have the main focus of the photo be. So in this case, it's the bottle with the note in it, and it's crossing, actually, there's two uh, points um, off to the right that shows that uh, where those lines cross. The, the horizon is not dead center in the middle. Um, and you pleasing, it's, they, they have proven, and I can't tell you why, but they have proven that um, mentally, when, when a person looks at a photograph, first of all, we read it left to right, if you're from the US, just like we read a book. So we, look at, we start on the left of the photo and look right. And the other part is wherever these lines join, it's more pleasing that people will spend more time looking at it um, just because it's not just a balanced in the center uh, type of photo. So a lot of times you can even do this in post cropping. You don't have to worry about it at the time because I know everyone's gonna say, well, the focus, you know, my focus is right in the center. Um, when I'm shooting things anywhere, uh, I'm actually changing my focus um, where the actual focus is in the camera when you look through this little dot in the center where it's focusing, I'm, I'm moving it left and right all the time to get this so I can keep what I want in focus, uh, in focus, but yet not have everything dead center um, lined up in the, in the middle. Um, so this is probably one of the bigger things that I think is super important uh, when you're doing photos. I think the other thing too is, um, at least for us and for me, this can be done either vertically or horizontally. If you are looking for a photo that you want to submit to our website for use on the website, you need to think horizontally, okay? Or the horizontal, long side, top and bottom. Um, because if you look at your computer right now, and you look at the screen, you're gonna figure out that whoever decided at one point in time that the internet and the web and all that good stuff is going to be horizontal. And that's kind of the way everything is laid out. So when you send us the vertical photo with this beautiful building behind you, and we have to try to make it into a horizontal to use it in this week in photos, um, we usually end up losing most of the building that, uh, you know, that we can do and use. So um, think about that. You can photograph it both ways. Sometimes it's better to be a vertical than a horizontal, but other times if you're looking at something, it's like, I want to submit this, and this is something I actually want to have uh, run in this week in photos, we would much rather have a a horizontal if we can possibly have that and that's the way this photograph was was taken here um, we will go to the next one so these are two uh, landscape photos that I have taken uh, the top one is in uh, Alberta Canada and you can see that the horizon is not uh, dead center in the middle but Part of it is because of the reflection of the mountains in the lake. But it's still from left to right, and one of the main focus points on it is the barn that's off to the right a little bit, kind of holds you there for a minute. Um, and of course, the mountains um, go from there. So this is the second part of, of the rule of thirds, but the second part of composition of landscapes and this type of thing there's three parts to it. There's a foreground, a middle ground, and a background. And if you keep those all in the photo, so the foreground on this is the fences across the bottom and the pond. The middle is the mountains and the barn uh, just on the other side. 
and the background is the clouds and of course the top parts and the full range of the mountains going across. So if you can possibly on most of your shots have a foreground, a middle ground and a background, it adds more depth to the actual photo um, that you're gonna end up with. You also want to use um, what we can, I will try to post something that, that explains this a little better, but um, there's depth of field on your cameras. And even on a cell phone, you can get depth of field. Depth of field is saying how much of this is going to be in focus. For these landscapes that I'm showing you, almost everything is in focus. If you remember the picture of the letters hanging, the letters to God in India hanging, um, just the middle of it was in focus. So just the center part of this is in focus. And this is called a very short or narrow depth of field. So for this type of thing, if you're looking for the emphasis to be on that and give you an idea of um, not necessarily the vastness, but the idea of uh, just um, a focus on the center part. You wanted these letters to be the focus and you can look at the lettering in the middle and know that it's there, you know, it's not written in English. It's not uh, type of thing. So we go back to the other. Yeah. So again, um, you know, this is pretty interesting because normally I'm like pointing at things and I just realized I think I'm doing any good to point at things. So it's foreground, middle ground, background. Okay. With all of these. The bottom right hand is the full moon over the island of Pico, which is in the Azores in um, Portugal, um, taken from actually the balcony of where we stayed. Um, so we are on one island and you're seeing another island um, off in the distance. Um, the, the horizon is close to the center, but it's, it's high enough that you still get the depth from the the, photo, the uh, buildings that are lit from the street lights versus the far part of the island versus the background uh, being the moon. So um, the moon is not dead center and neither is the island of Pico. So if you were to draw that thirds on there, it's gonna be pretty close to either the moon or the, uh, the far island to be um, on that rule of thirds. And what that does is, is you follow it with your eye, you actually end up looking at the whole photograph. You don't just follow the line across the middle and um, you're done and you just look at it and move on. So the idea is that it has a foreground, a middle ground and a background, and you still have uh, that rule of thirds. Everything isn't centered uh, right in the middle. So, okay, we'll go to the next one. And this is the one that's going to tell you, of course, all photographs are made from light. Light being the most important part of the thing. It doesn't matter if it's raining or gray. Um, if, you've been on, if you've been on campus long enough, you'll realize that is uh, kind of the way it is almost every day. So we kind of deal with that. And, but it's not, there's never a really, really bad day to not take photographs. So um, the top one is, again, is uh, taken in the Azores. Um, this is a, um, a volcano uh, basin or a cauldron, and it's actually eight miles across, and on the far side is the ocean. It's a very, very small island. And all of those lines you see are stone fences that they use for farming and pastures for, for cows. This is one of those photos that you are standing up on top of this cauldron looking across and you're thinking I could never capture what the vastness of this photo really is. You find that in the Midwest where you have those roads that just go forever and flat land that just goes forever and you're looking at it and you're in awe of the distances. Um, and it's very, very difficult to capture it to give you that feeling of um, the, the, just the vastness of how far across there it really is and how far you can see. Um, the clouds help, the sun rays help. Again, uh, 
nothing's really centered. The lines of all of those fences kind of lead to the center, um, which are our leading lines. It still has a foreground at the bottom, uh, middle ground, and the background being the, you know, the far mountain ranges and the fog and things like that. Um, was a perfect day, I think, to, I just love the clouds and the, a blue sky would have been awesome probably, I'm sure, for a photo, but this is a lot more dramatic um, than you're going to run into uh, just on a blue sky day. Um, I'm not a big fan of just blue sky days to photograph things. Um, shadows are, sh are harsh when it's bright and sunny, and overcast days end up giving you a lot more uh, detail that you can work with on things. The bottom right hand uh, photo or the bottom right is um, that is taken in Norway. Um, this is a recent trip. We were there to see the Northern Lights and we had two things really working for us when we were out there. One is all of those mountains and the lake at the bottom are lit, lit by the light from the full moon. So this was taken with a tripod. The exposure is um, the exposure is just probably 30th or 30 seconds, a total of 30 seconds. So it's a very long exposure um, on a tripod. And that was enough light to capture all of these mountain ranges. It almost looks as if it's daytime. And then the northern lights, um, which move uh, constantly um, across, uh, gives you a little bit wider version of them and you can kind of see the movement of the, if you look, you can see the movement of the clouds um, in 30 seconds. So you, you kind of have two things going here. It's a very calm lake. You have the mountains lit, so you have all of these snow covered mountains. You also have a little bit of movement, giving it a little bit of movement to um, the overall scene, uh, things that move. Other shots like this, when you talk about movement, that's really nice are you focus on a building across the street and someone rides by uh, with a bicycle. And if you're using a little bit longer exposure, the bicycle will be blurred enough that it gives you that sense of movement, that sense of motion, which is kind of like what you're seeing at the time. So you, sometimes you want that to be there and try different things. And that's the other part of it too. Once you have the photo that you think you have, try something different. Try a different angle. Try a different uh, length of time. Try, you know, all, you're not out of anything. Everything today is stored digitally and you may use up a bunch of space, but it's okay. You, you know, you're still gonna be able to, uh, you, you're just better off trying all different kinds of things because you don't know. Um, what you're going to get from there. But light is very important. Early morning, late afternoon, and evening is definitely the best. Uh, light, everyone knows it as it goes from what's called the golden hour, which is in the morning when the first sun first comes up until about an hour into sunrise. And again, when the sun is getting ready to set an hour before sunrise into uh, the actual sunset, I'm sorry, um, is what's called the golden hour. And then after that, you get what's called the blue hour. I think some of the best light that you can get is after the sunset. The sunset, once it goes below the horizon, you get amazing uh, colors. So when everyone else is like packing up and leaving, um, I'm usually still there. And that half hour, 45 minutes after the sun sets can be some of the most beautiful skies um, that you could have from there. So. Um, we'll go to the next one. So these are both submitted photos from students. Um, I really like these. I think that this has a lot of uh, a lot of interesting perspective to it in different ways. The one on the left is someone my guess would be almost laying down on the street, shooting across it. You definitely have foreground, middle ground, background. The depth is more of the people, the focus is more of the people, but yet you follow that photo when you look at it from the bottom right up to the top down that street. So it's got a bunch of things going for it. Um, one would be what's called leading lines, lines that lead you into the photograph. 
which this has with the street in the center and all of the vertical windows on the buildings kind of keep you there. The other is, I love this photo because it's got, you're right down on the ground and you get the idea, this is a really big hill. This is a cobblestone street. Um, it's on a day that is, it's not raining. Um, everyone's out. And it's, you know, it's definitely got um, a lot. The person that is the, the most prominent in the photo is not dead center. So you're, you've got that rule of thirds going with it again. And, but yet you can kind of pick out the movement of people. This is just a ordinary uh, day on the street of, I can't remember where it was taken, but um, you know, it gives you just that idea of what you have. On the right is definitely uh, leading lines because you follow the staircase right through to the very bottom. And that, and again, if you look, the people are moving and you kind of have that little bit of blur to the people that are moving in it. And it just has a great um, composition of, of following that from the top right around the spiral to the bottom. It's an awesome photo. It's, it's, and I like the idea of the people moving because it's just a constant uh, thing that you're in a very uh, public place. Um, and, you know, there's, there's actually a lot going on uh, with this photo. But the leading lines on this photo are just exactly what makes this photo work, uh, probably more than any of the others. Okay, Kevin, so we're going to the next one. This is the one that Kevin, can be, yeah. Um, just a note from Tom, the picture on the left was from Brazil, um, okay. from the program we share with Union College. Perfect. Yep. Anything on the stairwell? The picture on the left, yeah. Left, the black and white. <laughs> Okay, is Brazil. Right, right. yeah. I don't know where the staircase one is from either. Paul Chachi used to know all of these. Mm. You know, I, yeah. So there might be a lot of these guessing going on. So, all right, let's go on to the next one. This is the one I find sometimes the most fun, I guess when you are abroad, and that is just pictures on the street photography as you're just walking through the day. Um, street photography can tell a lot of stories. And you gotta have to kind of look for it and watch it. Excuse me, <clears throat> I don't have anything bad. Um, it's uh, one of those things that Oh, I want to say this. The privacy part of it can be an issue sometimes, but not necessarily. I've never had a problem with it. So I don't like to set the photo up. And then, or if I see something, ask someone to do the same thing again. Um, so that we would have uh, an issue that it does not look like it's actually happening. So <clears throat> Sorry. So part of this is just as it happened. But then I show the photo to the people that are in it, um, which is always fun because most people are like, you know, this is, that's me. That's awesome. Some may tell you no, they don't want you to use that photo forever. And which is fine. You just delete it out. But if it's too far away, like the lady on the bicycle I, at the bottom, I'd never shown her the photo because she was gone by the time I got to. So that is in Norway, but to me, that's how the people get around. Um, the streets are so narrow, the cars won't fit through there. So the bicycle traffic is, is a lot. And this says to me just how the houses are laid out. And again, you have the leading lines that follows you through that photo. It's not dead center. Um, and it's an everyday part of life there. It's the bicycles are always, um, that's how they go to the market. That's how they do everything. Um, very few of these small villages like this have streets wide enough for cars. The top photo on the left, <coughs> I'm going to sound like I'm, this is like the end of the thing here. Um, 
that is in the square in downtown Prague. And I found it interesting because I've seen this photo like a million times of different events and, and things uh, abroad, but I had never witnessed it. And it's just those things that happen that people can relate to. You've all seen this. You've all seen the mask. You've all seen the issues. They were actually doing a, it was a protest on um, pollution and ideas of the city and, and, and trying to keep, you know, things cleaner and, and this type of thing. Um, but it was interesting. It was a good gathering of, of people. You kind of get the idea. It's probably, you know, it could be anywhere, but yet it's a cause and it may be something, you know, um, so it's just a street photograph of things going on. Things going on around all the time are important. You're going to see them every day, whether it's people sitting on their sidewalks or, or, you know, their porches or this type of thing. But I really do try to um, capture it and then show the people involved. Um, the guy on the right uh, was in Portugal. He um, has been at the same fishing dock as a child uh, started there. He said he started uh, going with his dad when he was 12. He's been working at the same fish dock for who knows how many years. He's retired now. He's pretty much like the mayor <clears throat> of the, the whole thing. Everybody knows him. Everybody knows the dog, which is the best part. And he just holds the food in the hand. Everybody comes up, pets the dog every morning. And it, it's just an everyday piece of life. But it's something that happens all the time. And the people there know exactly uh, who this guy is, what he is. I thought it was awesome. He, uh, you know, it's just one of those personalities that you just, you just try to catch the personality itself. <laughs> okay, go on to the next one. All right, so these are some that I've taken because it's just part of your surroundings. Sometimes you do the same thing. Um, sometimes we see the same thing over and over, but we need to capture that same thing to show a little bit about this is what we did, you know, most of the time. And your surroundings that are around you all the time are going to be new to you when you travel abroad, which is awesome because compared to the people that are probably there every day, just like we are on campus, we don't see, we take that for granted. We've seen it so many times that it's just part of your everyday life. And you're going to remember when you come back that your surroundings are going to be very different and that people, uh, that's something you're going to want to be able to explain to people is what it was like being there. The top left is um, in Iceland, and these these jeeps that they have um, can take you on roads that you can't normally just rent a car and, and go and, and do this. And this was our life uh, for five days, was going from place to place in, in this jeep and with the, with a guide. And so this is actually uh, a, a riverbed that you normally wouldn't get to go through, but the mountains, the background, the clouds, the whole thing, this was part of our surrounding for every, you know, every day for a week. This is, we, we saw this Jeep everywhere we went. And, you know, people would ask, well, how'd you get around when you were there type of thing. So this kind of explains that. The one on the right of the shrimp truck was where I had lunch for the four out of the five days I was in Hawaii. Um, the best part is to the left of this is where they're catching the shrimp. So uh, pretty fresh. Uh, the guy would go out, drag it in, you cook it up. It's every different type of way you can make shrimp, they do in this little truck. Um, by the third day when I showed up at lunchtime, he already knew what I wanted because I everyone knows I'm a creature of habit and there's no Cam's Pizza in uh, Hawaii. So this is where I went every day instead. And they already knew what I wanted. And by the time I got up to the truck, they already had it prepared and ready. And, um, but it was neat to get to know the people. They were, they were like, well, how long are you going to be here? You know, type of thing. And, and you get to know them. 
and you get their personalities. And I actually have photographs of them working in the trucks because I think, but it's something you see all the time. So it is again, part of your surrounding that you have. Um, bottom left, uh, I will tell you that, so the, the other thing that I don't normally do when, when I travel is um, everywhere you go in most cities, there's the main place that everyone walks and everyone sees it. Uh, it's kind of like the best example would be like Las Vegas, okay? You're going to walk down the strip of Las Vegas, all right, if you go to Las Vegas. Most cities, Reykjavik, Iceland being the same thing, is they have that strip of the same stores that we have everywhere in the world. And that's where all the tourists are kind of uh, going from place to place. We, in turn, my wife and I, um, just went for a walk in Reykjavik when we first uh, arrived there. And just started walking around these back streets of uh, Reykjavik, like probably six or seven blocks from the main street. And what's interesting, and I'm not sure you're going to be able to pick it out in the photo, but it is, um, it is writings about women's rights <coughs> in three different languages. But what stopped me dead in my tracks was the bottom one because it talks about the women's right, the women's rights starting in Seneca Falls, New York. So I'm on a back street in Reykjavik, Iceland, reading about Seneca Falls, New York, where I live. And it's like, you know, I had to have someone translate the other parts of it, but it is different parts about the women's rights movement, which is very cool. Um, not what I expected to find. And when I talked to the people that lived in the city and lived in that area right there, um, they're like, oh, that's so cool. That that's where you're from. And we know about that and, and, you know, type of thing. So even when you're out and about, it's amazing what you find by just getting off the beaten trail and, and just do a little bit of um, exploring, I guess, on your own. <coughs> so uh, middle bottom is Prague on a rainy night. Um, I think probably one of the most beautiful times of the day is it's interesting that in Prague, by like 10 o'clock at night, there's nobody on the streets in these back, back sections of the city. It's very safe. Um, you'll find those areas. And this, to me, really kind of set my feel of what Europe was like when I was there. I, I loved it. It's um, the cobblestone streets, the water, the lights, the whole thing. And, you know, it just happened to be that, it, you know, 10 o'clock at night when uh, just there was nobody around. This was just pretty much outside where we stayed. Again, the narrow streets. Um, they do put cars down these streets, but it's only one. And I'm not sure we never met anyone else coming the other way but uh, with a taxi, but I'm not sure how they would uh, go about that. And the other is sometimes uh, the bottom right is um, Oahu in Hawaii. And it's a typical city scene that you, that you see um, in a lot of places. And I captured it mainly because the skylines of cities can be so different from the old to the new to, you know, uh, to you go to Berlin and this type of place where it's really, really different and that type of thing. And so I captured this because in Oahu, uh, Hawaii, all of their new building construction is pretty much right within the city. It um, is soon, there's actually ordinances once you get away from the city where they are trying to keep the far parts of the island the way they have been for, for a period of time. And I like finding out things like that, what really does make that work and, and go from there. All right, go to the next one. All right, uh, we're back at the Azores again. In that depth of field um, that I talked about, it's the same photo. But the interesting thing about the photo is um, 
if you can look at a photograph that you've taken and remember how you felt the day you took it, you've captured an image that is going to be with you forever. So I can remember when I look at this photograph, especially when I look at this photograph in a big uh, print or which we have in our house, um, you can still kind of feel the wind and, and kind of smell the ocean and kind of just get that idea of, oh wow, this is eight miles that I'm looking straight across. And feeling can be a huge part of that. And anyone that has been there, the same spot, this is pretty much a, a standard place that if you go to the Azores, you go to this spot to look, um, has told me the same thing. It's like, I can, I can feel like I'm there. I remember what it was like to, to feel the wind, you're up high and, and this type of thing. Uh, same thing with the one on the right, which is in Iceland. Um, we actually had to crawl under another waterfall to get to this one, which is inside the cave. Um, so it was kind of dark and very wet, but yet it just had a feeling to it that you can't forget when you look at the photograph, you can almost smell you know, that smell of being in a cave and being, uh, you know, in part of this and hear the water. And the idea that it, it, it's kind of crazy, but the emotion part of it can be huge. And I want you to be able to come back with images like that. I want you to look at an image and remember exactly how it feels or felt to, to be standing there at the time. What did you feel when you took that photograph? To me that's huge it's that's what you know and remember the other thing is you're not there to please anyone else but yourself the photographs that I take are not I want them to be me I want them to be part of what I felt what I wanted you to see type of thing and they're what I like and I always tell people go look at it and say oh how much of that is in Photoshop and it's like do you like it and they'll say, well, yeah, and I'll, I'll say, well, then it really doesn't matter because it's mine. This is the way I seen that. So um, go on to the next one. So these are examples of what I think really makes things work. Okay, top left, can't go wrong, right? I mean, this is a kid abroad that is loving every minute of it and is doing something. And they're they're working with these children. They're working with their surroundings. You can just see the, even though it's not real wide, you can see the surroundings. You can see the idea that this says, uh, you know, uh, what I'm doing is worth worthwhile. It's worth doing. Um, just below that, absolutely. These are the people that you are around all the time. Uh, <clears throat> when you're in these places and it's a combination of your group and the local uh, people that are, are inviting you into their space. And good composition, not dead center, maybe up and down a little bit, but at least not uh, uh, the horizons, not, you know, the people are right across the middle of the photograph. So that's a really good, you know, they have good composition to it too. And again, it's vertical or horizontal. I mean, I'm sorry, it's horizontal. So we can use that. We can use a horizontal photo um, easier. So it can be a little tough when the buildings are taller, but this is, you just have to back up a little bit. So off to the right, um, I'm sure they'll tell us, I'm gonna say Vietnam. I don't know if I'm even right. I don't know where it is. Um, but the lines definitely lead in. Uh, without any problem. You can tell uh, what type of habitat you're in. Um, this looks like a ride. I would go on this in a, in a heartbeat. Um, but it's part of what they did uh, quite a bit. And they would travel through these areas to get from one place to another and just has a really good uh, feel to it as far as um, uh, being somewhere and being part of out of you you know this is something we probably don't do in geneva so we don't paddle from one place to another maybe sometimes but all right go to the next one 
and we want to still have the fun photos because those are as important okay it's your group i'm on this boat how many times have you been on a boat in the middle of the ocean and you know you did different types of uh, you know you're going to be if this says to me i'm i'm happy and i want to go abroad uh everyone should uh the top left and you know type of thing uh top right is megan brown and this is the learning type photos that I was asking you for earlier. Um, you can see that uh, this is our professor working with our students on a boat, on a research boat. They're out, they're about, and they're doing stuff, uh, you know, all the time. And if you look at that photo, it's it just that's that's what you're going to be doing besides just you know the one to the left when you're which you're also going to do. You have the fun, but you also have to do some work uh, when you're there, and that's how that comes across. This bottom left, uh, pretty simple. Um, happy kids that are abroad. I you probably recognize some of them. Um, background of the building says, you know, again, we're not in the U.S. Probably uh, always good shots to take. Always good stuff to have. Um, bottom right, I love that photograph. It has something that I try to also teach people, which is called uh, natural framing. So with the trees up and around the top part of that and the city, the modern city below and the people walking down through the middle, it frames all of your attention to the center. So if you have the idea, you can do this with archways, you can do this with tunnels, you can do this with different things that you um, will actually frame the photograph within it um, to lead your eyes to the very center part of that. And it's at an angle right that you look at it and it, it's as if you were just walking right behind them. You can almost get that same feeling of, of uh, you know, following through the same path. Okay, and um, here we go. Uh, if you can do a backflip, Good for you, not me, but that definitely uh, brings of interest. It, it, the, so the fun stuff is as important as everything else that you're doing when you're there. And it is definitely telling a story. It's something we don't have. The only thing I ask or tell people about things like this is um, be receptive and respectful, respectable to the people and the places that you're at. You know, if if you're in a church and they say, don't take photographs, you don't take the photographs. If you are on a grounds that they consider to be holy grounds, I probably wouldn't be doing backflips. And uh, this just happened, this is a, they're everywhere. So the castles are uh, around and it's, you know, it's, it's a great shot. It's different, it's fun. Uh, we look for the fun things. And then if you look immediately to the right, you'll see this is definitely a class and the class is doing uh, their studies as they go and pretty much the same spot, but yet has a whole different feel to it. Um, so you're able to see uh, that actual work being done in, in the classroom. So it, it's, it, you're gonna combine the two, but you're gonna want all of these types of things. The bottom two, same idea. The top one shows, okay, we made it to the top of this thing. And, you know, you can see the depth. You can see how, <laughs> that you're definitely at the top of the mountain, <laughs> okay? And the one to the right is, this is our group. We did it. Here's the sign that says we're here. Um, both are great photographs to come back with. The first one just kind of shows, this is how we did it. The second one shows, yes, we did it, and here we are um, as a group. And your group will become very important to you, and as it should be, and try to get as many of the people in there, you know. Um, you're going to want to remember those people. These are the friends you're going to make for a long time. And uh, Okay, a couple more examples, and then we're about ready to wrap it up. So uh, dog sledding isn't anything that we have up here in upstate very often. 
um, but gives you that idea when I talked about the vastness and the angle and a little bit different perspective because it's being taken from one dog sled back towards the one that was behind them. Uh, it gives you an idea of uh, as if you were actually moving with them. So um, the only thing on this photograph that I maybe would have changed a little bit, but you might not be able to in the cropping, is the horizon running straight across the center, but it, it still works. It's uh, the dogs lead you across and you do kind of stop at that middle uh, sled, but you have the idea that you're on a different sled and it, it, it gives you that um, same thing. And again, at the bottom, so the bottom right I, is a great example of a group photo of students that are definitely somewhere abroad. You could take a group photo, and we get a bunch of them, of group photos, and you're standing in front of a brick wall, okay? And it's like, hey, we're in, you know, wherever. And it's like, well, I could take the same picture on, uh, you know, um, Exchange Street in Geneva against a brick wall. Um, so you try to incorporate your surroundings into those photos. So the idea, try to get as much as, as you can into that. And one more. Okay. I can tell I didn't write this because I don't talk about myself as a third person. Um, you want it to tell a story. You, when you come back, you should be able to have all these photos and the story is yours. And the stories are great. The Aleph uh, has a way that you can put things together. A publication that was put together by... Um, uh, your broad program and it's it's awesome so you you have outlets of things to be able to do stuff with it um, if you're gonna just anywhere that you are try to make sure that the photos are in focus um, I see this a lot movement is huge if you have to use a stone use a wall use whatever you need um, it's probably one of the most disappointing things is to see this absolutely beautiful photograph and know if it had just been a little bit sharper, it would be like this amazing photo. And I get it. I understand. You'll see I do a lot of stuff on tripod just because the older I get, the harder it is for me to hold steady. And But there are ways that you need to do that. So concentrate a little bit on trying to get it as sharp as you can get it. Um, and again, showing us what you're actually doing when you're there, not just the, the fun part of it, but also the work part of it, which hopefully will also be fun, but you need to show kind of the whole thing. What is your travel abroad experience like as a student? What is the student part of it? Take as many photos as you want and you can, because you'll wish you did. When you come back, you will wish you had photos of everything. Your host family, um, huge, huge, huge photos of people like that. That's, that is very important. Um, you're going to want to remember them. You're going to want to remember all of those parts of it. And then we want you to, when you come back and while you're there, we want you to share it. So um, submitting photos for the Aleph, which you can check out at the, uh, the web address um, and that's on, Jennifer, that's on your page, right? The, the submission for that, correct? Yeah. Um, you can submit it to This Week in Photos, um, either by using uh, publicity at hws.edu or send it right to me. And I will put it over into the folder. And we would love to get them. I wish I could have, this is the part in the class where I say to everyone, and they should be what? And we all say, horizontal and everybody's happy social media we use the hashtag hws abroad um, we also tag um, at H hws abroad or um, at, at hws uh, college and that'll get you our social media feeds we pick up on a lot of those each week gives us an idea of what you're doing we're able to use them on our social media to be share um, we want everyone to know we have been tops in study abroad. And there's a reason for that. And 
part of that is uh, also the fact that people can share um, when they're abroad, what, the, what they've been, what they've experienced. It's, it's huge. I haven't, I've only recently started traveling, probably in the last eight years or nine years, and I'm just amazed when you go to places. Your experience will be amazing. So um, there are ways to store photos. I will put a link together for you, Jen, that we can put somewhere on a page that teaches you how or shows you you can use the uh, box link now that is part of HWS and has an unlimited uh, amount. The hardest part can be sometimes is getting internet where you are, but uh, you can store there. There is um, Flickr, which is uh, part of um, some other programs now. Uh, they are just bought out um, recently by Photo Shelter, but you can do a free plan and, and actually put quite a few, uh, many, many photos um, in your folder. And you can make them public or you can make them private. It doesn't matter. It gives you a chance to share them with your uh, friends and family and all that kind of stuff too. Um, so there's not a whole lot uh, money-wise, I mean, that you have to do to get your photos shared and, and stored. Um, so you're not, because you, especially on cell phones, use the highest quality of photo that your camera or your cell phone will allow you to take. So you can lower the quality of the photo down to where, hey, look, my camera will take 10,000 photos on one chip. But what you'll find is those photos aren't worth a whole lot when you get back and you try to make them you know, into anything because you can't make them. Uh, the quality is just not there. You've already narrowed the quality down. Great. There you go. Thank you so much for a wonderful presentation, Kevin. Um, and thank you to all of our participants. We've already got some questions that have come in. Kevin, do you have a few minutes for sure. some Q&A? Yep. Um, so our, our first question asks, um, do you know anything I can do to enhance distance in my photos when shooting photos with my iPhone? Um, there is a couple things with iPhones and any type of uh, cell phone. You should uh, check out... Um, it's called, um, hang on, I got this. It's called Pro Camera. It's an app. It's probably like $6, but it lets you um, change the depth of field. It lets you, there's nothing you can do zoom wise, except for the new cameras now have more of a zoom to them and more of a wide angle to them. But at least with this, you can change the depth of field to get a little bit more depth of field and things to them. Um, it's hard, but it's no different than if you have a you know DSLR camera and you only have a 50 millimeter lens. Um, it's it's I I have not I'm gonna I have not used the clip-on telephoto accessory things for. Um, the cell phone, um, mainly because I don't use my cell phone. <laughs> but um, I know my wife has the new uh, iPhone, and we took it to Iceland or to Norway with us, and she actually got some absolutely amazing images with low light and you know that type of thing. But uh, Pro Camera is a, is a great app. Any of the the um, the cameras like that that lets you change your depth and give you a little bit more depth. Um, the other thing you can do too is most cameras have what's called an HDR setting called high high dynamic range imaging. Um, you will find it even on the older cell phones. HDR will then take three photographs and layer them together on top of each other to give you a little bit more of um, how much light you're actually able to capture. So you're not gonna wanna use it all the time, but you should play around with that before you, uh, before you go anywhere and try it out. You, you'll be amazed, like it'll have detail in the shadows and detail you know, in the sky that you may not normally get otherwise. It's, it's pretty cool. Great. 
Thank you. Um, yep. Our next question is, when shooting landscape photography, what is your approach to the angle you direct the camera at in relation to with what is in front of you? Okay, so that has, that's mostly how you feel at the time. So not very often when I'm doing landscapes, do I have a camera angle that is just plain straight eye level, just as if you were standing there looking at it. Um, I usually try to use an angle that's either higher or lower. Lower, I, I do quite a bit because that allows me to get that foreground into the photograph and then you have the foreground, middle ground, background. Um, so sometimes, you know, the perspective can be laying on the ground. When we talked about the perspective of things, that's what landscape photography is all about. So you may have to go lower to get like this big rock in front of you or um, some flowers in front of you or, you know, that type of thing. Um, if you go on my Facebook page and you look through the landscape stuff, you will see a lot of times the angles are usually pretty much lower. Um, I try not to get the straight on, this is what it would look like if I was just standing there and held the camera up to my eye. Um, if I do that, or when I do that, it's more because I want people to be able to see it exactly the way they're going to see it when they're there. But if you're looking for something to make it a little more dramatic, um, it's definitely you go higher, lower, uh, you know, um, so you have a little bit more uh, foreground, background type stuff that you can work with. And gives you just a little bit different angle than what maybe everybody else has gotten. Um, Great. Thank you. Yep. Um, do we think we can do maybe two more questions? Yep. If that works for you? Okay. So the next one, how do you find inspiration to take new shots in an area that you have shot many times before? That's a great question. Is that Natalia's question? That's uh, <laughs> Um, Barb. <laughs> it's interesting that I, I've been at the college now 18 years. I love it when I find a new spot. Um, and sometimes it's not just the spot, but it's the time of day. It's the weather. It's that can be the inspiration. Um, the last This Week in Photos that we just did of the empty campus was a lot of thought process to it that I had never really thought about what it looks like when there's absolutely no one there. I mean, it's very different. And the idea of those photographs was to give you the feel of how different it, it is. Um, the other part, at least for me, that I have to remember is that um, the students change every four years. <laughs> So what you think, um, what you think people have seen before, they may not necessarily have seen before. I try not to go to the, I mean, I do take what's, I call them cliche shots, okay, from the landscapes that you're talking about is exactly, you know, everyone has the picture of Niagara Falls showing the Horseshoe Falls um, from the railing. Well, Maybe you need to walk one way, another, something different, lower angle, higher angle, that gives you just a little bit, something a little different than you might normally see it. I think you, you have to really, when you walk up to something, you, you look at it and you look at the overall everything and say, how can I make this different? Maybe it's shooting through or, uh, trees or shooting through something that frames it naturally. Cox Hall, to me, you can take a picture of Cox Hall, but if you take a picture of Cox Hall from the other side of the quad and you frame the entire thing with the pines that are on the far side, it's a much better photo of Cox Hall than you would have just standing out on the quad and taking the same photo. Hopefully that answers that. We get a thumbs up from Barb. All right. <laughs> um, why don't we go to our, our last question that we might have time for today. Um, They'd like to know a bit about how to take good night pictures and how to make them clear and not fuzzy. Yeah, the biggest thing, first of all, it's gonna depend on the camera that you're using. 
and this is where the pro camera works in. So basically the light is brought into a sensor. There's a sensor either in your camera or in your phone that is capturing the light. The size of that sensor tells you how much, in the black and white days we called it grain, and now we, it's called noise, and under low light conditions, you will get more what, what we call noise, um, which is okay. I, you know, I mean, if it gets too crazy, it, it doesn't work, but you're gonna wanna be as steady as you can. So whether you find, um, I use a tripod a lot. Um, I will use just a stone or a, a brick wall or something that you can hold the camera to hold it steadier. Um, up against to get those shots and with something like pro camera for and you're going to want to use a very on a DSLR you're going to want to use a very slow shutter speed so you gather more light so the, the the shadows have detail in them and then it won't show as much of this grain and in a cell phone the DSLRs or a cell phone you can use a pro camera and actually be able to adjust the same as you would the speed of that shutter which will allow you to have more light i tell the students that work for me i would rather have a picture with a with noise in it and have it sharp than to have a blurry photo that doesn't have any detail into it you know what i mean it's it's just so you you kind of deal with it um the newest uh phones from everyone that's out there the night stuff is absolutely amazing Absolutely. I mean, they, they actually call it night, you know, uh, you can have, there's a night mode um, to them. But it's, it's a lot of long, long uh, shutter speeds and tripods. And you can buy small, just three little legged tripods that fold up and, you know, they're the size of your hand. And you can put that on a wall or the ground or any of that stuff for a cell phone and just so it holds steady um, when you're taking the photo. Hey, Jennifer, uh, yeah. this is Greg, real quick. Hi, Greg. Uh, thank you very much for doing this. IT used to do stuff like this when I first started 15 years ago, not video, but they mm -hmm. would invite us into a room, teach us how to do Excel and stuff like that. Could we sometime with Kevin do a more technical one about what shutter speed and what about a white balance and stuff like that? That would be a cool thing to do. I understand what you're doing tonight. Mm -hmm. That would be cool. I know Kevin's old and he needs a tripod. We went to high school together. Uh, but again, thank you so much for doing this tonight. Mm -hmm. um, and and I, Kevin, I really like that one third thing. Today, by mistake, I moved on the side of a statue and did a one third thing and it was the best photo I took. So right. thank God. Now I got that in my head. But Great. I think more of this would be good. Mm -hmm. And I congratulate you for putting it together. Thanks, oh, Kevin. Fantastic. Thank you You're for welcome. the feedback. Um, yeah, Kevin, we'll have to talk about future collaborations. I guess. Keep you busier than you are, right? Right. <laughs> yeah. It's going to be time to write it right now. I have, you know, yeah. um, it's, it, you know it's, it's definitely an interesting world right now. For and sure. And for me, it's, it's been interesting trying to capture different things to still keep everyone as part of the campus. Um, it's difficult. It's difficult for everyone, but uh, this is the time of the year that, you know, when it's like, uh, not the time of the year, but the time in our, our lives right now that uh, we can try some things. We have a little bit of time to try some things. And I, I think if you're getting ready to go abroad, you try as many things with your camera before you leave. Um, and you have to remember that most programs will tell you what you did. It'll tell you the shutter speed. It'll tell you the depth or the aperture. It'll tell you all that information. And if you like it and it came out good, look at that information and figure out what made it that way so that you can do it again. Great advice. So, yeah. Yes, but, uh, that's wonderful. Just, just keep shooting and uh, shooting horizontally. <laughs> and make our life more interesting, easier. So. Great. Now, um, before we wrap up, I just wanted to, 
to uh, remind our attendees that we have an upcoming uh, virtual event, the Global Visions Photo Contest, which is going to be Thursday, April 23rd at, at 6 p.m. So uh, there will be more information about that to come, but just to put it on your, on your radar. Um, and I wanted to thank Kevin once again for, for your time today. We really appreciated it. Um, I know I always learn something, so I hope all of you did. Um, and I hope everyone's staying well. Um, and we hope that everyone has a great night. Thank you for coming. Thanks, guys. Be safe. You too. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. This is the part I always get messed up on. Uh, How do I leave? How do you leave? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Good night. Thank Good night. you. Bye bye. Bye now. Yep. There should be a leave button, Kevin. Oh, he got it. All right. Thank you all. Have a good night. Good to see you.